Hey, it's a new series here, everybody. Welcome deeper into Scrum. We got professional Scrum trainers Todd Miller, Simon Rindel, and me, Ryan Ripley, coming at you, talking about the Scrum framework, but we're going deeper than we normally do, bringing you some content that we hope helps you get ready for your assessments. Right? Lots of good certifications out there, PSM1, PSM2, PSM3, and also gives you a deeper perspective and viewpoint into this framework that we're all trying to use to get some products delivered, to get some good work done. Guys, I'm pretty excited about this new thing. What about you? What do you think? I like that beat that we got introducing it. That's yeah, pretty good, isn't it? Yeah, it's pretty good. Keep it going for a minute there. So, of course, this is kind of a different setup. Normally we're talking, we're doing the day, your daily scrum. We're doing the basic frameworks. This is more advanced. Something that we decided to do, we got the authors together. Of course, Todd and I wrote Fixing Your Scrum. Simon co-authored uh, the scrum.org book on being, a, on, a, on being a professional scrum master. It's Mastering Professional Scrum. It's in the scrum.org series. And so between the three of us, we've written uh, some industry standard books on the framework. And what we want to do is take that content, talk through it, but go deeper. Right, we actually want to to get you in a position to pass your assessments, get the job, keep the job, uh, and help you deliver some great things and serve your teams along the way. What do you think, guys? I think that's it. It's like, how can you help your teams get stuff done and continuously learn and improve? That's where we're at. So, Todd, you've got a great format here that these videos are going to follow. Right. So we've got these ideas on on how to structure these. Uh, with a nice lens that Simon's provided as well. So where do you want to start here? Yeah, I, I think we start with a foundation, right? So we, we do have a flow. I think we're going to step through the flow here. Um, but the first thing we want to do is introduce some foundational things, like some stances that you take as a Scrum Master. But first of all, we're going to start with Scrum Master choices, right? Um, yeah. And so I'm going to have us all come down, check out these choices, and maybe Simon, you sort of talk about them a little bit. Yeah, so this is the model that Stephanie and I came up with when we we're writing our book. And we're thinking about the choices that you will make in your daily dance as a Scrum Master. Um, some of them are more self-evident, teaching, mentoring, coaching, facilitating. Um, pointing North is helping the team understand where they're going and how you want them to go. And so this taps right into using the Scrum values and being... A, a responsible citizen uh, as you deliver. And then you've got the upholding Scrum, just helping people learn and use the framework. And the two actions, uh, the hardest one we often find is actively doing nothing, letting the team learn and grow on their own so that we don't disempower them. And opposite to that is taking action, which we need to do from time to time, particularly when safety is threatened, safety of an individual, the team or the product. But Basically, we're going to dance through those, you know, and if you think about your daily uh, work, you could probably recall a number of times where you might have danced through all of these in one discussion. Mm -hmm. When do you use those choices and how can you use them appropriately? You know what else I look at when I see these choices, Simon? I see that um, I see strengths and weaknesses in myself with some of them. Like for some of them, uh, like a teaching stance for me comes natural now. It didn't in the beginning. It's something I had to work really hard towards. Um, one of the things I have a hard time doing and reminding myself is to be uh, actually doing nothing. And I, I think I think in this series, uh, when, we, when we present some of the things that we're going to discuss, we're going to refer to these choices. And I think something that will be uh, compelling for everybody to consider is which stance is easy for them to take, but just because it's an easy or choice to make, just because it's an easy choice to make doesn't necessarily mean it's the right choice. So I think identifying your strengths and weaknesses, this is a, a, a really great looking at these is a really great eight uh, choices that you can identify strengths and weaknesses and build from there on. Yeah, part of what we hope to do with this series and other series as well is help you build skills within these within these areas, right? And, and I think what's going to be neat about these conversations that we have about the different areas of Scrum and the topics and the situations is that we can apply these, these stances in different ways. So perhaps we'll take a situation and look at it. What would happen if you only mentored here? What would happen if you made coaching your stance here? And so I think this, these lens, this lens will give us a nice way to 
to talk through your choices, to talk through uh, options, and then some of the impacts that that could have. So hopefully this uh, this helps you really see the depth and the, the complexity of the of the role you're stepping into. You have so many choices. Context is king. So many different situations. Some we're going to get right, some we're going to get wrong. But hopefully these videos help you make more right decisions than wrong ones. And uh, you improve and grow as a scrum master. And being able to identify when you make, uh, when there's a chance to make a different call or if the call's not going the right way, being able to pivot and mm -hmm. course correct. That's that's key, right? Being sensing what's going on with the people that you're working with, figuring out whether it's going slightly south and getting it back on track. Mm -hmm. So that you're you're uh, you're you're doing your thing, and that's why I think Scrum Mastery is a craft. Mm -hmm. You need to practice it. You need to work on it. And you need to grow it, nurture it. So, Todd, what does the pathway or the journey or the the trip that we're going to take? How does this? How's this going to work? Yeah. So, you know, in in conjunction with uh, the choices, we there's a there's a couple of stances that we brought in here: uh, change agent, impediment remover, role model, and conflict navigator. And so. Uh, we're going to we're going to talk about the very foundational elements of scrum but then we're going to get deeper into some of the things um, um as we'll step through you'll see we'll talk about what the scrum guide says some simon says some rules and simon it's a really nice easy plan word just to say simon says right? um we're going to go into a situation and uh then we'll talk about some common anti-patterns as referenced in fixing your scrum um before we go some tips on getting started I'm going to walk through each one of these now, but before I move on from these stances, uh, anything else to add there uh, about these stances, Simon? Um, I, I think the the choices that you make will help build this out. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Scrum Master, the way you behave, well, I think everyone within a team, everyone within an organization should be mindful that we should all be doing this regardless of the accountability that we hold. Uh, that's That's the first point. It's called out particularly strongly for a scrum master though because you should be working with uh, individuals your scrum team as well as the organization uh, helping people get rid of things that slow them down mm. and helping people enter and exit conflicts gracefully and that's that gets tricky when we start crossing uh, cultural boundaries national boundaries stuff like that and the best way i've found is to actually walk the talk um, if you can role model those behaviors and demonstrate to people how you should roll, it makes it a whole lot easier for people to see what you're on about. Yep. Awesome. Yeah. I'm, I'm excited as we can, as we can apply some of these to the, the, the sections that we discussed. And so Ryan kind of to hop back into what you said, and we're talking about these, you know, we talked about the choices, the stances. Well, the format is that we're going to start with. Now, um, we've defined Scrum, and that's for free in the Scrum 101 series, right? This is deeper into Scrum. This is looking at situations. This is really diving in. Uh, what we like to do in the beginning of this, though, is to level set uh, what the Scrum Guide says, right? So we're going to level set what the Scrum Guide says. So kind of for an example that I put in here is how the Scrum Guide defines Scrum, right? So uh, uh, the Scrum is a lightweight framework that helps people, teams, and organizations generate value through adaptive solutions for complex problems, right? So we have the definition of Scrum in here. That is purposely incomplete. That Scrum is based on empiricism, inspection, adaptation, transparency, and lean thinking. And it's backed by the Scrum values, commitment, focus, openness, respect, and courage. So this is what the Scrum Guide says Scrum is. Anything you want, want to add in there, Ryan? Or No, I think this is the section that uh, we're going to ground in theory. We're going to remind you of some of the basics. I think fundamentals are important. So before we take that deeper dive, we're going to make sure there's a somewhat level playing field. We all at least know what's in the guide. And so this is a good refresher. And then we're going to, uh, we're going to use this as a springboard into uh, some more advanced topics. And before we even know what... Simon has to say about this. We're going to hop down into the Simon says section. What do you have to say about the framework, Simon? I, I think the the values that you called out are critical. They're core uh, because without the Scrum values, we we don't build the trust. Um, and when we demonstrate those Scrum values in balance, we grow trust, and that enables empiricism and that whole ability to be able to share what's going on, where we're at. And most importantly, to inspect and adapt. It's 
very easy to inspect and not adapt. So the framework helps us deliver products, but it also helps us to get better at delivery. Um, and I think we'll be exploring that, um, particularly with the case studies, the scenarios, the situations, we'll be able to dig into those and tap into our experience and share how we've used the framework to learn and help grow teams and better products. And I just threw a couple big notes that we got from you there, Simon. Um, uh, the values are critical. Trust enables empiricism. Uh, the framework helps us uh, get better at delivery. Um, you know, one thing that you said, and I'm going to put a Simon says down here for you, is that uh, Scrum is not just for software. What, what, what about that? Yeah. Um, thanks for reminding me of that. I've, like I've worked in every industry except tobacco, and that's just the luck of the draw. But uh, I've helped build big physical things with it, uh, build mechanical things with it. Um, I worked with teams that were drilling for oil with it. Uh, I've worked with legal teams, uh, administrative teams. It is not just software. And uh, that's a really important point because the world is becoming more uh, complex. And anytime you've got a complex adaptive situation, Scrum is one of the ideal, like I'm a huge fan of it. It's a great framework to help solve problems in this complex space because of empiricism. Love it. And I wanted to throw that in there. I want to remind you of that. So we did Thank that. You. And now we're going to go up and put Ryan right on the spot. Ryan, uh -oh. ready? I'm ready. Situation room. So this is a situation room. We're going to put together a situation and then we're going to talk through and answer kind of all three of us talk about how we might handle it if we were a scrum master. So Ryan, you're a scrum master. A manager comes to you and says, scrum is great the way that it's described and the way the scrum guide says, but it won't work for us here the way that it is. We're going to change it to make it work for us because we've been in business for a hundred years. Yeah. I very common scenario, right? Something we, we, we come up against an organizational impediment and rather than deal with the impediment, the decision is to change it. And as a scrum master, I think I just say, congratulations, you just found a great impediment that we need to work through. And so why does this thing scare us? Why does this thing hold us back? Why does this thing bother us? And what is it that we truly need to do in order to not change the framework, but modify the way we work? Um, you can give a lot of theory. You can give a lot of um, uh, discussion here. But I think the big idea is, is that if we do not uphold scrum, which is one of our choices that Simon talked about, right? If we do not choose to uphold Scrum and to teach and mentor those who are trying to change the framework, uh, we run the risk of falling back into our old practices with new names. And so we're going all through this time and turmoil and investment, trying to change the way we work just to end up back to where we started, uh, which is a tragedy in and of itself. And so in this, this scenario, my choice is to uphold Scrum it is to encourage the team. I, I want to leverage that scrum value of courage, and I want to get them to really focus another scrum value on driving through that impediment and making sure that uh, we can actually uh, change the way we work, that we get effective change, that we improve the way that we deliver. As Simon said earlier, we're, we're using the framework to improve delivery rather than just slip back into that old way of working. And so this is why we uphold scrum. This is why we use the values and if we can if we can effectively mentor and coach in this space as well, I think we can earn the right to keep Scrum intact and to take that impediment head on. What do you guys think? Yeah, it's um, often I find when you're working with folks, they say we're doing Scrum, um, and you go in and help them, and you have a look, and they're missing some of the elements. Like there's. The 14 elements, the three accountabilities, three artifacts, three commitments, five events. And you can almost tick list it. Like, have you got these in place? Tick, 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 tick. Yep. If you've got all that, you're doing Scrum. Great. Um, and this is where, you know, if you've got a, a piece of dough and you put some sauce and cheese on it and bake it, it's a pizza, right? But if you fold it over, it's a calzone. <laughs> and what I find is a lot of people calling calzones pizzas, which is not on. And so, first of all, helping people, and this is the teaching Pete, teaching people exactly the Scrum, what Scrum is, and getting rid of a lot of the Scrum myths, because many times I find people saying Scrum doesn't work for us. And they're talking about a complementary practice that somebody said they had to do. And you, and you check back in, and 
they can actually do scrum. It's just there may be some complementary practice that is not fit for what their way of working. Been the complementary practice and they're golden. So being clear on that, getting it back to basics, like you said, Ryan, and just, hey, let's let's just do this and see what we learn from that. So just be, be honest what it is, chew it up, get back to basics, learn what you can do. I like it. What do you think, Todd? Yeah, you know, I'll, I'm going to add one thing. I'm going to be I'm going to be very tactical about this. So Scrum is great, but it won't work for us the way it is. Um, I want to know why. I want to get the reasons why. And now I've got stuff to work on as a Scrum master. I've directly just heard a conversation and found a conversation that points to me reasons why Scrum won't work. And although I might not be able to fix and solve everything right away, I've just got my starting position of where to where to go, where we need to be. And so maybe Scrum won't work for us because we have different departments and it's hard for us to have a cross-functional team all working on the same thing, right? Maybe Scrum work work for us because, as Ryan, you stated, we can't focus because this team's working on four different things. Maybe there's a lot of things in there that I can compile. I've got a list now, right? And I pick one of those things and I on myself focus on it and try to make an impact, right? So uh, very tactically, I've got my list. Uh, I, I want to know why from that manager. Um, and I've got, I've got a list of things to work on. So, you know, and Todd's highlighted a, a mentoring moment, right? You, if you have permission to, to be a mentor to this manager, or maybe you only have permission to be a coach, I think either stance could work here. But what Todd is highlighting is that organizations, uh, they, don't, they aren't working in the way that they're working by happenstance, luck, or chance. They're making choices. They're choosing to organize their teams a certain way. They're choosing to which platforms they work with. They're choosing not to address tech debt. They're choosing to, to work on too many things. And so reminding people that these are choices you're making. These are, not, these are not rules in place. These are things that you're choosing to do and you can choose different and better, uh, I think really goes a long way in these situations as well. So I love how Todd is immensely practical and he goes on that tactical path very, uh, very well. And just adding in there that remind people you're choosing to work in a certain way. You can choose differently and we don't have to mod modify the, scra the, the framework. We can simply jumble the org chart, right? Let's build a cross function. You have an org chart problem. You do not have a scrum problem. And I think that type of mentoring and coaching goes so, so far uh, in helping teams uh, get through this type of issue as well. Yeah, and I saw Simon, you're trying to drop a sticky note there. I'm going to do it for you so everybody can watch me navigate here <laughs> a little bit because uh, yeah. I think it's an important point. So I'll type that up while you talk about it. Yeah, what you're describing there is one of the key activities that we perform is being an impediment remover. And that's what you've described. It's like, why can't we do stuff? They're, they're impediments. And you don't wait until you're stopped. You wait and as soon as you hear about it, you go and hunt it down and get rid of it. Um, if you get your list, and this is Agile 101, right? You get your list of things, order the list from top to bottom by value and go after it, resolving them one at a time. Because what we're hearing from this manager is there's a concern. There's a Typically, there's a fear or a concern. Um, and every time somebody says, why, you can always be curious and say, why not? And this is where we can sit in the coaching space for a bit and just start talking about, um, you know, well, why, why not? What's, what's holding you back? I love it. And if we demonstrate that we can get rid of the impediments, it opens up the gateway for, for improvement. And there we go. We've unlocked the, the stasis, the inertia, and then we can start building the, the momentum. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and so I think all the things we're talking about is why we like this situation room concept, right? We're going to hear different thoughts, different ideas, maybe grab one that seems relevant to the context of your situation, because you're going to hear different things from the three of us, because all three of us have different strengths and weaknesses, right? Um, so you're going to hear different perspectives. We've been in different organizations. We've, you, we've been a scrum master in a lot of different circumstances and a lot of different contexts. So I think you're going to get a blend of that, just like, just like you did in this, in this situation room. And what we're going to segue this into is other common anti-patterns. Now, 
Ryan and I mentioned, uh, you know, we wrote the book Fixing Your Scrum, um, uh, and it's a it's a very great companion. I feel like our books just went really well together, Simon. But what we're going to do is highlight the anti patterns that we wrote in the um, in 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 Fixing Your Scrum and any additions that we may have newly discovered or that Simon kind of calls out. We're going to talk about them. Uh, we might talk through each one of them or one that's really sticking out to us that we hear maybe some comments from people, but this is going to be an area where we talk about some common anti-patterns um, as it relates to the particular topic. And this one is just deeper into Scrum. We're talking about Scrum in general here. Yeah, this could be a, a seven day video uh, <laughs> if we were to go into all the anti-patterns. In fact, our right. book is probably a hundred of the most common. Um, mm -hmm. But as Todd said, this is a space where we're going to say, look, here are the common speed bumps, pitfalls, traps, um, some ways that we've addressed them. You know, Simon's got uh, a ton of experience in a lot of different industries. I've worked as an executive. Todd's worked as a great product owner, along with a lot of other blended roles, right? We've all been scrum masters. We've all worked in, in different ways. And we can attack these different anti-patterns from different perspectives, which we hope give you a ton of ideas on how to combat these as well. And so we want to be immensely practical in this space. We we don't want you to just walk away going, oh, great, another theory video. We want you walking away going, here's three things I'm going to do immediately after I close my browser, right? Yeah. This is, or after I put my phone down, here's three conversations I need to go and have because, you know, of these ideas that, uh, that come out of these sections. And so this is our goal uh, with these sections. And if we're looking at common anti-patterns, I think changing the framework is one of the most common scrum, you know, mm -hmm. in general anti-patterns that we see. It's, well, we're not going to have a scrum master because we couldn't justify that expense to our, our CEO. Mm -hmm. Well, try harder, right? Start, <laughs> right. And, and we'll work through why that's such a big error, why it's such an unforced error that uh, it's worth investing. And I think the other anti-pattern that comes up a lot is, hey, this is our new delivery methodology. No, 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 no. This is not a project management methodology. You are being opportunistic and you're using empiricism to win in the market. Like this is so much more and not really understanding the, the power of the framework. And so a lot of great things there that we will certainly help you uncover. We'll dive deeper into, but also give you things that you can do in your organization to, to really dig in and be successful as well. I just want to call out something you highlighted there, Ryan. We're going to offer experiences and things that we've seen. They're not best practices. There are no best practices. Right. We've got a couple of examples, anecdotes, things that have worked at some point in time that may help you. But from there, you can then go and riff on it and find your way because you've got to find your style. And so Ryan, Todd, and I all have uniquely different styles. Uh and they work for us. So you got to find a way of how you're going to use your style to be effective with your teams. You know, Love sometimes sometimes you're taking a nice little uh, raft ride down the lake and you're learning as you go. And sometimes it turns into rapids and sometimes you're going over the waterfall. Right. And so hopefully our advice helps you navigate where you're at as you're as you're on that journey. But can, but it also to Simon's point, sometimes you got to paddle in a, a slightly different direction than what we did. But if it gets you to an awesome spot to where your team is successfully delivering, they're doing it joyfully, the customer's delighted, uh, you're del delivering value that you can validate and you're, you're winning in the marketplace, then that's what we're after. So don't copy us, learn about the print, listen to the principles, listen to the thought process, and then apply that to your context. That's, that's how you go deeper. Um, copying is a, is a beginner step. Going deeper means you take the principles and apply them and think and do that deep work. Yeah. And, you know, some of us aren't even on water. Some of us are on land. So that just yeah. shows like a complete different context. So and that's where I think this 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 final section we're, we're, we'll give some ideas on. Oh, there's your impediment remover sticker. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, in this section, we're just going to give some getting started. And, you know, just to reiterate what Simon and Ryan were saying, uh, there's no one clear path to get started, but we could talk uh, conceptually uh, uh, some things that you might do. You know, as, as we talked through the situation room, we gave some ideas about having a list. Um, so some advice that I had mentioned in there about getting started is don't work on all those things at once. Too much change at one time can be destabilizing. So Stay focused, uh, work on what you think might bring the most value to you delivering. Let's highlight that concept again, because the three of us believe ultimately that this is to deliver, 
right? Yeah. Uh, so what is going to enable you and give you a quick win for delivering uh, in this circumstance? But uh, getting started, this is this is a section where we'll, we'll kind of sprinkle in some nuggets like that. And that's something that's in both our books, uh, yeah. sprinkled throughout um, mastering professional scrum and fixing your scrum. There's checklists and advice and just thoughts, questions to provoke your next step. And this is the most powerful question you could ask as a scrum master. What's the smallest thing we can do to get better? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not the biggest, just the small, small sustainable change, like small steps. Yeah. Yep. I like it. So this is a, a different type of series than what we've traditionally done on the Agile for Humans channel. Uh, something that's going to be different that uh, you will notice almost immediately is that this is will this will be a membership only video series. And so we need your feedback on that. How do you feel about a monthly membership charge in order to continue watching uh, us go deeper and deeper into various Scrum uh, ideas, perhaps even looking at interview questions and looking at different ways to, to build a career as a Scrum master? So lots of different ideas there, but we need your feedback. What do you think about requiring a membership? What do you think about putting it behind that wall? Um, and how... Uh, how do you think that'll work out? So we want to know, first of all, what do you think of the content? What do you think of the structure? Uh, what do you think of the, the the path that we're going down? But then this is going to be members only. What are some thoughts there as well? And uh, we'd love to read those comments uh, in the section below. So please do leave your comments. Uh, let us know what you think. Like and subscribe so you don't miss when these future videos drop. Um, and we can't wait to jump into this journey with you and to help everybody go deeper into scrum and to level up. All right. What do you guys think? Let's do it. Let's do Excited it. About it. Thank you very much. All right. We'll see you all soon. Let us know what you think in the comments until next time. I'm Ryan. That's Todd. That's Simon. We hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you next time.